Welcome back, everybody. Um, <clears throat> this is our second seminar session of the day, and I'm delighted to introduce to you um, Adam and David from the LTSMG, who will be talking to us today about the impact of COVID um, on the higher education sector. Um, Thank you very much for joining us today, both of you. We're all very much looking forward to hearing what you have to say to us all. So without further ado, I shall hand over to them. <laughs> Thanks. Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Um, Morning. So we're at SMG. We, we work in higher education. So we thought we'd just give you a little bit of an insight into a little bit about what AV requirements are in universities and what we do, and a little bit about the group that we represent, LTSMG. So, a little bit about us. I'm Adam Harvey, so I'm the Joint Chair of LTSMG, and I also am the AV Solution Architect at the University of Hertfordshire. So, it's our way of calling me the AV Manager of the University. Hi, I, I'm Dave Ammon, and I, I'm based at the University of Cambridge. Uh, I've worked at Cambridge now for or about 15 years. Uh, I'm based at the business school there in Cambridge, and basically I run the, the audiovisual services uh, at the business school. Um, my background, I, before my time in the university, I worked commercially in the audiovisual sector, uh, and uh, I'm a trained sound engineer and musician, very keen brass player, if there's any brass players around. Uh, I'm a euphonium player, that's what I do as a hobby. Excellent. Uh, and I joined the LTSMG uh, exec, uh, last year, um, slightly on the back of hosting the conference in 2019, but we'll, we'll come on to tell you a little bit more about LTSMG. So the first thing you'll probably go in is who are LTSMG, what does it stand for? So we're Learning and Teaching Spaces Managers Group. We've been going for 25 years, and it's a group that's been set up by higher education, AV, and learning space managers, and now adding the IT into it as well. So it's kind of a group that we have a, a really good forum. Uh, it's, a, it's good practice sharing. It's um, you know cries for help with particular bits of kit or particular scenarios that universities have got. You know it's a really big community. There's about 400 members in the group now, mostly UK and Ireland, but we have got quite a few international members. And it's chances are if you're struggling with something or you've been asked to deliver something that's a little bit outside your normal comfort zone you fire a message off to the group and 30 or 40 people reply going, yeah, I did that yesterday and this is how you do it. I think in education, we are really, really good at sharing stuff. It's not like the corporate world where everything's a secret. So as, as an AV manager of Hertfordshire, I'm constantly diving in and out of other universities to look at stuff they've done, copy it, make it better, and then install it in the University of Hertfordshire. And then that, you know, that process happens to us. People come and have a look at our stuff. And we sort of have a self-perpetuating, you know, good, good way of developing the services that we're delivering across the entire sector, not just for our institutions. Have I missed anything? No. no. Um, so our key focus of, you know, our key event of the year, we run a, we run a big three-day conference where, you know, much like this, is funded by our sponsors, and, and we fund delegates from universities to come and you know, stay with us for three days. We put on presentations, we have a sponsor exhibition, we have some great nights out for networking, and we try and build that community up through over that event. We have obviously started to do a lot more online stuff now, mostly kicked off by the last two years. So yeah, we, we kind of, it's been going a long time, but it, it was very, uh, a much smaller organization. So we relaunched it in 2017 gave it a bit of a better structure so we could start to do more for the, the, the higher education AV community. We've got a lot of partnerships with manufacturers and distributors, so we, we're, in a, we're in a good place. We've got a lot of diversity in what we can offer people who come to the events. Um, this year we're running an in-person event at UEA in Norwich. We've got 39 partners with us for that one. Um, the last one we run in person was Cambridge 2019 at Dave's Place and Obviously, for the last couple of years, we've not been able to do that, but a little bit about 
that one first, Mr. Romero. So the yeah the, the sort of focus of of the group is our annual conference, which um, traditionally has been held every November. Um, we we move to a new university every year, and uh, someone has the uh, the pleasure and privilege of playing host to the annual conference. Uh, and um, my my turn, if you like, came up in in 2019. Um, someone put my arm up behind my back, I think, two years prior to that, and said, you yeah, will host, yeah. won't you? Uh, so, something, um, like something like that. <laughs> so we, we, ran, we ran our annual conference uh, in Cambridge. Uh, I mean, little did we know then what was coming in 2020. Uh, and you can see some pictures here from, from our conference in Cambridge. So the format of the event um, has kind of stayed the same for a few years now. We have uh, an arrival on uh, early Wednesday afternoon, uh, that's followed by a campus tour, so we'll, we'll visit a few uh, faculties and departments, have a look at the teaching facilities. Uh, then on the Wednesday evening, we have an informal drinks reception, which is the, the first point that the uh, university delegates and our sponsor manufacturer representatives will get together, uh, and then we have an evening of networking. The conference then itself proper starts on the Thursday morning uh, with some uh, welcome talks, uh, keynotes, and then that's normally the point that we'll move into the, um, the, the trade show, if you like, a trade exhibition, which you can see up there in the, in the top right. So that was at the Cambridge Guildhall. And I think, I think we had about 33 exhibitors for Cambridge, mm. around about there, um, across two halls. Uh, then in the afternoon, uh, we then move into a series of uh, talks and presentations. Uh, you can see a uh, panel discussion uh, that we, we had there with a mixture of uh, industry representatives um, from, from most sort of sectors, we've got university representation, uh, we've got uh, the um, Audiovisual Association of VIXA, um, we've also got a member of faculty, in fact, from, from my university there, um, and if I remember rightly, that's Anna from Google? Amazon. Amazon. Careful, Amazon. Um, so we, we always have a real good spread, uh, and the panel discussions kind of become, if you like, maybe slightly uh, infamous at LTSMG. Uh, but it's always a, a really um, good uh, and engaging, thought-provoking part of the part of the program. Uh, and I've got to mention on the Thursday night is when we have our gala dinner, uh, and we were very fortunate that we were able to have um, the formal silver service dining in Corpus Christi uh, dining hall for for our Thursday night dinner, which which was really wonderful. Um, and then the conference finishes on on the Friday lunchtime um, after some more presentations and time in the exhibition. Uh, on the Friday, and then, and then we head off home. So COVID came along uh, in 2020, but that didn't stop us. We said we still want to have a conference. Uh, the membership um, still want, um, want there to be an event. So the way we decided to approach that is to, if you like, launch the at-home event. So the 2020 event was run from um, Adams Media Studio at the University of Hertfordshire, and was done um, almost entirely live. Um, <laughs> yeah. still, still bearing the scars. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, an entirely live day on Zoom. It was, um, only, it was only 15 hours long. Yeah, that's all. all right. That's all. Uh, and I was there at the end. Um, and that incorporated most of the features of the in-person conference. Um, and I think, I think it's fair to say we did that really well. So there was yep. still um, conference goodies that you'd expect to have in an in-person conference. You can see the boxes there that were sent out and some of the contents of them inside. Um, presentations, talks, panel discussion, we had all the same. Uh, we had a virtual trade show, so using Zoom breakout rooms where you were able to um, meet, your, uh, meet a selection of manufacturers and have a discussion with them about the products that they, they wanted to showcase to you. Um, and in fact, we still provided um, a meal for people um, I think I can say that we sent them a, a, a voucher for a, a well-known uh, fast food delivery company. Um, so they, they, they still got their gala dinner. Um, and then, in fact, we also had entertainment. Um, we did online beer tasting, uh, which was very, very well received. It was gin, gin this year, beer last year. Indeed. So um, we took it up a notch for 2021. Unfortunately, we still had to stay online because COVID was with yeah. us. We need to plan this event far ahead um, to secure the venues and the fact that LTSMG is, by the way, not our day job. Our day job is running the AV services in our respective universities. Um, so we decided we'd take it up a notch because we were going to have to do a second year online. 
We were very fortunate to be given the use of the Harmon Experience Center in Hemel Hempstead um, as the host venue. And you can see from the pictures there, it really is quite a stunning uh, venue. It's basically a large demonstration suite for their range of products. Um, and we ran the event, again, uh, live online. There were some pre-records, but don't tell anyone. Um, so it's largely, largely live um, from, from the studio there. And again, it was a full day on Zoom, um, very much the same sort of format, talks, presentations, panel. Um, it, yeah, it was a very exciting day. Um, I don't know what to add to that. It's, it's actually all available to watch on YouTube, if you like. And if you pop by our stand, you can there, see yeah. some of the highlights. Yeah. Okay, so enough about us. Um, I'll move on. So what we're going to do, because I'm from Hertfordshire and Dave's from Cambridge, we're going to do a couple of little case studies about where we are, you know, where we were teaching and where we are now. So University of Hertfordshire, a student population of about 25,000 students. We're a campus-based university. We've got two large sites in Hatfield. Um, it's a greenfield site, we've got loads of space. We're not like shoved into buildings like some of the London universities are. It's actually really nice, green, airy campus, nice place to be. It's really close to London, excellent transport links. I know I sound like a pr prospectus, however, it is kind of in, it's kind of important. We have our own bus company as well, but you know, that's to shift students around. So, I mean, what I'm trying to sort of say is the, the university setup is students on campus. That's how we run the business. Um, from an AV point of view, you know, we, we don't just do teaching rooms. The university is a big organisation. So, you know, we have audiovisual services in teaching rooms, meeting rooms, all the learning spaces, learning resources centre. We've got corporate boardrooms. We've got simulation facilities, engineering facilities, you know, like kind of anything you can think of um, that requires students to be able to learn in. And it's all about seeing and hearing content. And that's, that's kind of what we have to cover. So, you know, it, it is about learning, absolutely, but it's also about the business as a whole, you know, retail outlets, digital signage, wayfinding. So it's, it's quite a big job to cover for, for every university. Um, so February 2020, University of Harvard is really only at its pilot stage of remote working and remote learning. We have some courses doing it. We have our School of Law, who probably at that point were one of the most advanced because of their student body. They, they do a lot of distance learning. Um, we were with Teams. I think we, I've put down the... Oh, so I'll go back to lecture capture. We've got about 530 bookable teaching spaces at the university. 130 of them were covered by lecture capture. So bearing in mind, you know, like I said, all the students on campus, suddenly, March 2020, got no students on campus, and we're actually uh, sort of thinking, oh, what do we do now? We were at a point where we were piloting Microsoft Teams in the university. We had 250 licenses. So within a week, the university basically shut down for seven days and we moved all staff home. We increased our Teams licenses to about 35,000, I think it was, in seven days. And we moved all of our on-campus teaching to online in seven days. So that's every single program the university deliver. We've got a, a staff population of 3,000. So, you know, it's quite an undertaking to do in seven days. I mean, I'm only one university. The whole of the sector had to do the same thing. So we, you know, me and Dave used to have really, really long hair. Yeah, 2020, done. Yeah. You know, head waxed the whole job. Um, so it's a really steep learning curve for everybody. So it's, but, I mean, I, I have to give credit to our academic community. They've sort of picked up the different ways of delivering content really quickly and it it did start off with like you know here's teams you need to now deliver all your teaching on that and it's like well I've never seen it before how do I use it but but very quickly it got to the point of like yeah why can't I do this with it which is actually where we want it to be because we can start then we know that they've got to grips with the technology and they're trying to now replicate their in-class teaching to online and trying to work out what tools they need to do it um, so it's delivery of in-person content online isn't the same as online content. It's very different. So, you know, every member of academic staff had to look at what they were delivering and try and rework what they've been doing for the last 10 years, really, in, within a week to, to carry on delivering the student experience. Um, <clears throat> we did have a lot of support from the student community. Absolutely, they were in the same boat. They wanted to carry on with their degree programmes. So they, you know, they, they needed... The, the lectures to be delivered 
Um, it was, you know, there was a lot of delivery from kitchen tables, absolutely, to start with. And I think there was a, a honeymoon period with it, that everyone was a bit tolerant of it. But as time went on, you know, the, the students felt, the university felt that we needed to have a more polished product going out as a, as a university thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, as probably you hear in the press and stuff like that, the students, you know, some students complaining that it wasn't the experience they signed up to. Absolutely. If you've signed up to go to university, you want the university experience as well as all the content delivery and the stuff you're learning. You know, seeing a home in front of a laptop is not like going to university. So, you know, the campus-based universities really had to manage that very well. Um, so we're in a scenario, really, where we've got a completely empty university and we know we need to change because we're going to have to carry on delivering and we don't really know what is going to come at the end of COVID. And we've got a perfect opportunity to work in every single room in the university, which we never have. We normally have to like cram our installation into six weeks summer. But of course, you know, everybody halted spending. Everyone got a bit nervous about what we were doing, what was going to carry on, how's the university going to look financially at the end of this. So it was a bit of a weird one, really. We had ample opportunity to do everything, but no money to do it. Um, it did for us create a lot of opportunities. So it certainly, from our staffing point of view, it massively stepped our technology forward and our digital transformation forward. Um, so much so, our vice chancellor said that, you know, he was so impressed with how it worked and the feedback from the students about how flexible they could be with their learning that he wanted every single program in the university to be blended and flexible delivery by 2025. So that's, that's a big chunk of work for us. Um, with hybrid technology in teaching rooms, we didn't jump headfirst into it. We didn't rush out and buy a load of stuff to convert teaching rooms. We went with a more consultation process and tried to work out this question at the bottom, what is hybrid? Because it means such a different, it's a different, difficult word. It means a different thing to everybody. And it, it can mean a different version of hybrid depending on what course you're delivering. So it's a really difficult one to work out. You have to sort of drill down right into what, what does that particular program need to deliver and where and how and what do the students expect. So it's, it's, a, it's been a long process. So as I said, we're a, we're a campus-based university and our key priority is to get the students back and the staff back. So we are definitely going to benefit from the elements of online learning and working. But, you know, fundamentally, we want our students back on campus because, you know, that's, that's, where it, that's where the university experience really comes from. We developed this thing called Hearts Learning, which is some principles to deliver this blended and flexible teaching. So, I mean, looking at it from an audio-visual point of view, I'm expecting that we need to make a load of our teaching rooms available so we can have remote participants and in-person participants. Our hearts learning goes a lot further than that. It's about you know, looking at how each course is made up and how you deliver each part of it and how it gives the best student experience using the technology that we've got available. So my little bit there to work on is the harness technology. Um, as that breaks up, I mean, it doesn't say anything about hybrid teaching in teaching rooms, but this is the kind of parameters we have to work in now to just get give the students the flexibility to have stuff delivered differently to before. From a University of Hertfordshire point of view, we had a, a tried and tested you know, product family of AV kit that goes into teaching rooms. You know, it, it, depending on the environment, we use product A, B or C. Um, it's a standard offering. We do flex it to different environments and different delivery methods and stuff, but fundamentally, uh, an academic at the University of Hertfordshire can walk into a 25-seater teaching room or a 500-seater teaching room. Everything will look and feel the same. The UX on the touch panels is exactly the same. The layout on the lectern is exactly the same. So they don't have to grapple with the technology so much. We've obviously started to change that now. We're starting to work on the hybrid version of all of our stuff. But So this is the thing, right? So we've sort of got to work out what an academic needs to do to deliver hybrid teaching. 
And there's just a big load of stuff here. So you get to the room after your 10 minute changeover time, you turn on the AV, you mic up, you load your presentation, you start the lecture capture recording, you join the Teams call, you connect all the remote participants, you deliver the content in the room, you engage with the students in the room, you engage with the students online, you monitor the chat, you just make sure that everything's good, you make sure that we have GDPR policies as well so we don't record students who don't want to be. So there's a process if they don't want their voice heard, they hold their ID card up. So you have to manage that as well. And bear in mind you're live on Teams and being recorded by Lecture Capture. So now there's two things you need to stop recording to do that. You finish that all up, you disconnect, pack up and go. So that, you know, that was our, this is how you do hybrid. So we said, who wants to volunteer? And of all of our academics, we only had 15 who said, yeah, I'm up for that. Not surprising, right? It's really difficult. <laughs> so. Our job now is to really try and take all the joining tax away from that. So you walk up to a teaching room and it is delivering online and in person and you don't have to worry about the technology. So, you know, we go through and say, what do you need? And it's, I mean, I've put, obviously, easy to use, clear, intelligible, intelligible managed audio. They want to share the desktop collaboration. Easy to use comes up almost, you know, every time, multiple times that they don't want the what I do now scenario because it just trips everybody up. So, you know, we have to kind of work, try and design a system that, you know, you can just, you know, basically it works automatically. So, you know, we've done some interim measures to try and get people going because, as you know, there are some lead time issues with the hardware at the moment. So, you know, we've been throwing things like meeting owls and Logitech meetups and little USB radio mics just to get people something so they can get their content out from a teaching room. Um, sort of going forward, you know, we are looking at ceiling microphones that have got mics that can pick you up wherever they are and track. They can talk to the cameras to make sure that we are, you know, the cameras track around. They don't need to, the academics don't need to worry about the microphones, the cameras. We, we're giving them the opportunity to sort of have multiple monitors and confidence monitors so they can see what's going on. All of the stuff they've got to manage, try and make it as easy as possible. Put in confidence monitors for the far end in an eye line so the engagement with that remote participant body is good. So you're not looking down or looking down at your laptop all the time. You're, you're engaging with that group of students who are not in the room as much as the students in the room. And it's, it's really difficult. You know, our policy is try and give them the same experience, but it's clearly very difficult to do that. But if we're just trying to do the best we can at the moment. And our first generation of hybrid won't be right at all. It will just grow and grow. Um, as I said earlier, we don't just do teaching rooms. Obviously, our, our entire staff population now, we've started to look at how do we work differently. So that's another string to the bow, really. The, our vice chancellor said that you know, he, he, was a, he says himself, he was a very presentist person. Everybody had to be in the office to be effective at working. He's done a complete 180 on that now. The university didn't fold over COVID. It just it continued to run. It did very, we, did, you know, we were quite successful. So they started to look at flexible location working. So it gives staff an opportunity to just, you know, not do what they like, but, you know, within the business need of the university, have a campus space, but you have the opportunity to work at home certain days of the week. But obviously we need a whole IT program to back that up. We can't just say, yeah, you can work at home half the week, but you haven't got any kit to do it. So it, again, it's a really big undertaking for the university. Um, yeah, and again, meeting rooms, people are starting to do hybrid meetings. So again, it's kitting out what was a meeting room with just tables and chairs in to, to screens, you see sound bars. Um, Microsoft Teams room rollout, stuff like that. So it's, it's a really, really kind of big technology piece for us going forward. Um, yeah, massive demand for personal USB speakers and webcams. And, you know, people are starting to actually want to create more professional content at home. So they're buying proper cameras, mics, ring lights, stuff like that. But we, we need to support them as much as we can. And basically, we're trying to do that in a scenario where that is pretty much what we're finding is the stock levels of AV in the country as we're trying to buy stuff, it just isn't available, or we have lead times of up to eight to 12 months. Um, you know, the university won't change now, and actually it's really difficult for us to deliver that. 
So that's hearts, nice and easy. <laughs> Hand over to Cambridge. <laughs> So, yeah, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the University of Cambridge. Um, you've probably heard of us before, a um, little university out in, in East Anglia. Uh, we've been, been around a few years now. Um, when I was looking up some information about the university, it turns out that we're the fourth oldest in the world, which, which I never knew, but there we are. That's what happens when you do your, do your research. Um, we've got over 24,000 students, uh, both undergraduate and postgraduate, and actually over 11,000 staff. So, um, unlike... Hearts being a campus university, if you know Cambridge, really the whole city is the university. So the University of Cambridge is comprised of 31 colleges, which are actually legally and financially independent of the university. Um, they are, in some ways, you could think of as like the halls of residence, um, and they're also where students receive their, their supervisions um, with their director of studies. There are over 150 academic departments that make up the University of Cambridge. Now, this makes for quite an interesting uh, state of affairs, um, especially those of you who, you know, perhaps who are the manufacturers amongst us who've um, tried or do work with Cambridge, you'll know that the departments and colleges really are all quite independent of one another in the way they work. I see some nodding heads uh, and knowing looks in the audience there. Um, now, I think that's both a challenge and an opportunity. Um, it's a challenge, of course, because we could be making better use, perhaps, of purchasing contracts with doing um, much larger sort of rollouts across the university, as some of what Adam described, with, say, standardised models with like the, the teaching stations, the user interfaces on the control systems. That's something we haven't really got the opportunity to do, because each department will have its own way of managing and running their audiovisual and, to some extent, their IT services. Now, I think where it gives us an opportunity is that you can then have a more tailored solution for each department. So us at the business school, you know, our, our teaching is of a different style to so perhaps uh, my friends over the road at the Department of Engineering. Um, their teaching is probably a bit more didactic, uh, whereas the teaching in the business school is perhaps more case-based, much more discussion-based, and that's certainly something that's um, given us some challenges with regards to the online um, learning side of things. So what I'd like to show you is some of the things we've done at Cambridge that we, we've done in response to the COVID pandemic. Um, and it, it all started really just as COVID was hitting in March of 2020. Um, the, the work at home um, decree was issued and, and that's what happened. Everyone immediately um, started working from home. Um, all in-person teaching was stopped. But we did have a set of residential programs that were timetable to run in that week uh, before lockdown came in. So the decision was made quite quickly that those residential programs would still go ahead. However, they would be delivered live online. So the question was, how do we do this? And it was my, my job and a few other people to make it happen. So what we did uh, in the business school was to identify some of our meeting rooms. You can just see on the left there, uh, sort of an eight-seater meeting room. Um, they weren't going to be used for anything else because, of course, we were basically just about to turn the key in the door and walk away from, from the university for we didn't know how many months. So we did have the run of the place. Um, but obviously looking slightly longer term, knowing that this thing wasn't going to go away, we needed to find some rooms that were going to be suitable for you know, medium-term use as effectively a, a pop-up studio, should we say. So we removed all the furniture. Um, we found ourselves some screens from a local AV hire company who had very good availability. Um, you know, as I think we know, the, the uh, events industry was so severely impacted um, during COVID. Um, they were very, very happy to deliver some screens to us for short-term hire. And I, th I think they actually were with us in about 25 minutes after I made the phone call, so that was, that was great. Um, so we, we did three of these rooms um, in this particular part of the building. And what you can see here is um, one of our faculty delivering a live online lecture um, to his class that are all entirely remote uh, in their own homes. So we're doing it on Zoom. So on the left-hand side is the gallery view of Zoom where you can see uh, all, the, all the headshots there of your remote students. And then um, Michael's slides are on the right-hand screen, uh, which he's been presenting live to the group. And we've got a camera between the two screens there, which is, uh, which is his shot. 
uh, and he's wearing a, a wireless lapel mic for audio. He can obviously hear, hear those guys, he can hear the students, they can talk back to him, and then they can have a, a full um, live two-way conversation. Uh, and we did that um, in three rooms uh, simultaneously for a week, um, and everyone was exhausted by the end of it. Um, so, and it worked, and in fact, we've still got um, those three studios in use now. Um, I don't know if they're being used this week, I'll come to that. Um, but they've certainly been used for the kind of the whole two years we've had of COVID so far. We've done certain things just to make improvements, like we've changed the camera uh, to a PTZ that can be remotely operated, so it just makes it a bit easier for framing up. Um, we've changed the audio. We've, we've done a few other things just to make it a little bit lighter touch for faculty to go in and present. Again, as Adam was describing, there's, there's sort of so many hurdles and, and buttons to push and barriers and we're just trying to remove all of those and all the way through COVID the process have really just been trying to iron that out and just you know look for efficiency savings. So let's now move to one of our lecture theatres. So this um, is a, one of our theatres uh, that we uh, opened in our, one of our newer buildings in 2017 and the adjustments we've made here uh, are for hybrid delivery so that's um, live online with a remote audience. So you've got students in class, um, but at the same time a group of students who, who are remote and are, are part of the same teaching session live. Now they need to have, as far as possible, um, full interaction with the, with the teaching session. So they're able to see and hear everything that's going on in class, and I mean everything. Um, and then they need to be able to contribute into the class so that everyone in the class can also hear and see the remote students. When you actually start to think about that and unpack it a bit, that is actually a real challenge. Now, it's not too bad in case of adding in cameras to face the lecturer or cameras to face the, the uh, students in the audience. You know, there's definitely some compromises to be had there, but um, certainly wearing my sound engineer hat, um, audio is going to be most important. Now, the biggest challenge we found with this sort of situation is capturing the um, sound from your audience. Now, one of the options would be give everyone a push-to-talk desktop microphone. Yep, that'd be great. Nicely close mic'd. However, uh, certainly at the point once we got back to higher capacity in the teaching rooms, you're then looking at, say in that room, 79 microphones. That's very expensive. Um, in some cases, that's outside the capacity of a standard system. So, you, you know, there's technical considerations there. You've got the cleaning aspect of it. Um, you know, if a lecture is only an hour, you've got to go around and clean. Someone's got to clean 79 mics for every changeover. So, you know, that's, that's not really hugely practical. That said, we did deploy that solution in one of our lecture theatres very early on in the return to in-person teaching. Um, partly because it's such a large theatre, and with the very low uh, occupancy we were doing at that stage, it was a workable solution. And obviously it did provide voice lift, which is quite nice. So, where we've got to, and what we've done in a number of our theatres, is to um, go down the road of ceiling-mounted microphone arrays, which you can see hanging off the, the soffit there. Um, and those particular ones are from um, Sennheiser. Hi, Inesh. <laughs> Um, and they, they work very well for us. Um, obviously, you've got to put them in the right place, uh, and you've got to spec the right number for the size of room, um, but we're finding them very effective. And uh, for reference, we've got those paired up with um, a QSC Core 110 um, DSP. There we go. Just checking to see who we've got in the room. <laughs> so an another angle of the same room, um, you can see the confidence monitor that's been added in there in, uh, in front of the front bench. So that would um, typically show the gallery view for Zoom or Teams um, so that you can see your remote students on that screen. And again, you can see, see the ceiling mics from that angle. Uh, there are some cameras there, but uh, they're, they're quite small, so you can't quite see them in shot. Let's just make sure there's nothing I'm going to miss. Let's just move on to what, what we see the future as being. So at Cambridge... Um, it's very much about the in-person experience. So we did return to in-person teaching as soon as we possibly could. There was all various measures we had to put in place. Some of them obviously were, were legal requirements, um, you know, distancing, et cetera, et cetera. 
as the restrictions have eased, we've been able to get back to a much more in-person um, teaching model, which is clearly something that we want to we want to stay with, and that's very much um, one of the, the the key principles of Cambridge is the in-person teaching experience, and also the, the whole experience of being present um, in the city and and in your college environment. Um, now, what we have learnt from uh, hybrid is, as Adam touched upon, hybrid meetings. Hybrid meetings is definitely something that is, I would say, here to stay. Um, it kind of was never, it's not a new idea. It's something we've been doing quite a long time, video conferencing people into a meeting. But now it's something that's far more accessible uh, and people can do with the most simple equipment from the comfort of their own homes, uh, from their sofa, etc., any, anywhere in the world. Now, within the, within the teaching realm, there are some things that we're looking to explore Again, online teaching. So we know that with some of our courses, live online is actually a way that we can go. And in particular, within our executive education program delivery, um, which has a different teaching style than our core degree programs, live online is certainly something that we, we're looking to um, make greater use of. So I've got a couple of renders that I'd like to show you, um, which is a, uh, a project that we're exploring at the moment. <coughs> Um, with an external partner, um, um, and hopefully this is something we'll be delivering in the business school in the not too distant future. So the solution you're seeing here is um, a live online teaching studio for a fully remote audience. So we've got the presenter uh, in the room there um, with a video wall of uh, remote faces in front of him. Every uh, face gets uh, their own um, permanent location on the wall, so the, the gallery view um, stays the same for that teaching session. So each student will, will remain in that place for the duration, which makes it much better for engagement uh, from the lecturer's perspective. They're not having to hunt around to, to pick out a particular student. Um, there is a camera, essentially, for every student. So um, if you look at a student to engage with them, you will be looking directly at them, um, at their webcam, and they will get a, a like an, an in, in the eye experience, which is fantastic. Now, not only that, there is directional audio. So this is all about increasing engagement at both ends. When the remote students speak to, to ask a question, they've got a raise hand feature, with his, which is a, a graphical notification. When they then speak to the lecturer, the audio will come as if from, from their face, from their, their screen, um, which then draws the lecturer's attention to, to their virtual presence, and it just helps improve that engagement. Um, there's um, tracking cameras in the space. Um, there's obviously audio as well. Um, and we think that's a very, uh, very exciting project. And as I say, we're, we're still in the early design stages of this, but it's hoping, uh, something we're hoping we're uh, going to deliver potentially later this year or, or next year. Now, something that's perhaps more within um, the degree program environment is um, a room here, which is something that we're exploring, which is kind of a, um, a discussion or sort of case-based room. So you can see how you've got a student group who would be working um, together, uh, perhaps on a case study, uh, but then they've also got the video wall experience, as we've just sort of just discussed on the previous slide, um, with the directional audio, the persistent headshots, um, et cetera, and the unique cameras. They've got the opportunity there to either maybe link in with a, a remote student cohort or maybe connect with um, experts in the field who are, who are remotely located. Um, and we think that's a, a really exciting room um, to, to sort of take their, their learning, particularly, as I say, their sort of discussion and case-based learning, um, to another level and, and open other opportunities to them that they perhaps wouldn't have uh, without going into the, the online world. It's, it's been a real um, pleasure and privilege for, for us yep. to speak today, um, as a, particularly for me as a member of the Institute. Um, it was uh, fantastic to be invited to, to come and give this talk. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much for being so attentive and, and for being so engaged with, with our content. Thank you both very much indeed for a really informative talk. Thank you.